Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Welcome to the Bare Naked ABCs, where we cover every single Bare Naked Lady song alphabetically from 7 to Y. At least that's our plans right now. As we know, Bare Naked Ladies are out currently hopefully trying to record their new album so who knows there might be some z's in there there might be a number that's lower than seven but for now it's seven to y um we are without aaron this week unfortunately aaron had to go to his high school reunion um and so we we aren't going to have him this week he's going back to seeing all his friends from grade nine but joining me this week we do have Mill, Mill, thank you for joining us. No problem. I'm glad to be here. And when when we were talking about uh, songs way back when we were doing drawing, I asked you what song you would like to come back for, and you said Grade Nine. Definitely want to do Grade Nine. Yeah, just from the point of view that um, it's a very different phenomenon. It's like a very specific phenomenon, Grade Nine for Americans, and it's not something we have over here in England. So I thought it would be interesting to hear what it's actually like rather than just the song that i've got so (laughs) and it's interesting so bringing up grade nine in canada at least in ontario um for quite some time there was their high school went from grade nine to grade Mm. 13 Mm. they've since gotten rid of grade 13 Mm. uh, so it's i think it's more aligned with what we have here in america which is high school is nine to twelve right um, but yeah, grade nine is this phenomenon where like all of a sudden you're in a new school with a, you, oftentimes a new bunch of kids. I'm sure that up in up in Toronto in Scarborough, in the suburbs of Scarborough, like they have very similar to what like a lot of us do, where a lot of schools kind of come together for that grade nine. And all of a sudden it's a whole new amalgam of people that they're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, we have that, but we don't get that until the penultimate year because we have sixth form in the final two years, of which is year 12 and year 12, so year 13 over here. Those two years, only some schools run sixth form, so every school kind of mashes together for those. So that's when we have our equivalent. But you're like 16, 17 then, so it's very different to what's in this song where you're 14, 15. Oh, it's very different, it sounds like. Mm. The ability for 17 and 18 year olds to be in a school with 14 year olds and not treat them in a horrible manner, to put it nicely, <laughs> um, is, I think, nearly impossible. Like, well, no, you, get... s- <laughs> you say that, but like over here, we only have primary schools, which you know is elementary schools, and secondary schools, which is middle school and high school combined. So you have everyone from age 11 to age 18 in the same school at secondary over here and weirdly enough like the sixth form the top two years just do not interact with the bottom two years and that takes all the pressure off of it so by the time you're in year 10 which is our grade nine you've already been at the school for at least three years you're like you know you've got three years of younger kids who are not even teenagers below you so you're not the kind of weird little newbie kid that is described in this song so <laughs> so your grade your your middle school is sort of like what we have for that grade nine which happens much earlier we don't have middle like, school at all we just have two schools so yeah right, you have your your primary and secondary yeah you just like you in, like secondary school is kind of split up into little groups like the first three years are kind of split off and then there's like two years and there's two years but it's you're all mixed in together and 
they all kind of like aside from Sikh form you all wear the same uniforms and stuff so you seem all mixed in you can't tell the difference really but you don't me- you don't mix outside of your year group socially at all in secondary schools here so you don't get these sort of being picked on situations that you're in this song so you mentioned uniforms oh yeah <laughs> So you guys didn't have to go to dances wearing red leather ties and rugger pants and... Uh, yeah, no, I don't understand how you can have a tie made of leather. I wanted to ask if that's an American thing or an 80s thing or, you know, (laughs) your generation. I I think it's a mix of the two. I I think the leather is definitely an 80s thing, especially with, like, I, I don't know if it was Canada, but definitely in Maine we had that as well, like these leather ties... Or these, like, really fake ties. Like, they they were not natural-looking ties at all. And we did that a lot in 8th and ninth grade. Like, we thought they were cool for some reason. Not sure why. Or if, or if it was more of our parents being like, yeah, that's cool, go wear that. <laughs> it's, but I specifically remember seeing that at the dances quite often. Okay, because over here we had ties as part of our uniforms. So you would never wear a tie to anything you know like social because it was just a sign of uniform and formality over here so you know, we don't have any of those dances i mean now that our culture's become really americanized over here and we trick and treat and things like that we do have two we have two proms one when you're 16 and one when you're 18 but that's the only dances we ever have in england so wow yeah, we, well, I watched things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Where you got like the homecoming dances and this Sadie Hawkins dances, and it's like it's so a different world. Like this whole song is just a completely different world to me that I wanted to have explained by coming on here. <laughs> so yeah, dances were a regular thing. Like I would say probably like once a month there's a dance, but every other month it's a like kind of ritualized. Uh, like there is a name to it, like the winter formal or the, you know, as you mentioned, homecoming or Sadie Hawkins dance. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a ongoing thing, which is supposed to be a positive thing. But as I remember, and I was a pretty awkward teen anyways, they are the most awkward situations possible, especially in grade nine. <laughs> so why don't we get into some of the song at like, just jump. We've already kind of been jumping in, but let's just get right into it. Yeah, sure. So this week we're talking about Grade Nine, which is off the Gordon album. Found my locker and I found my classes. I went for lunch and I broke my glasses. That guy is huge. That girl is wailing. First day of school and I'm already failing. This is me in Grade Nine, baby. In 1992, um, it was written by all of the Bare Naked Ladies members. It is the first time and the last time that we see that happen that tyler Mm. gets a writing credit until we get all the way to To snack time snack time yeah and and then after that why say anything nice from barely Mm. ladies are men but that's it like that's the only times he gets these credit Mm. oh then also with red rocks um Uh as well so uh, but he doesn't get a writing credit there. He gets a performing credit. Mm. So we should identify the people that are in the song because as it goes through, there's a lot of people that are kind of kind of throwing in their thoughts in there. So there's lines in there like, so that we have the, this is me in grade, not the deep, deep voice. Yeah, I think that's Jim sounds like to me. I think it's this sort of... It is. Yeah, I think it's like the reference to voice breaking around that sort of time. Yeah, it's it's really cool because that's not the voice I would ever expect to come out of Jim's mouth. <laughs> no, it sounds like he deliberately has his voice drop like in the middle of one of the lines. I can't remember which one it is in the middle of it, but yeah. So we have Jim doing the deep voice. Mm. We also have them each saying what they were called in high school. They call me chicken legs. They call me ball ride. They call me fatso. They call me buckwheat. They called me Eddie. At least that's what oh, we're yeah. assuming that we that that's what they were called. Or they're not just yes. making this up. Um, because yes, there were a lot of nicknames, usually not very flattering, <laughs> in grade nine. It it was often. We'll, we'll come to the minor niner line in a minute, but it was very much because of that phenomenon that people were given really negative nicknames. The first person says, they call me Chicken Legs, that's Jim. Mm, makes sense. Four Eyes was Andy, which is interesting because at sense. that time, like, four of them were wearing glasses. So <laughs> it could have been any of them. Mm. Fatso was Steven. Poor guy. <laughs> 
Tyler was buckwheat, which you would never guess now because he's he's bald. Um, but at the time, he actually had the dreads and everything. Yeah, it's not the <laughs> time I've ever heard in England, but I mean, my school was very, very white, so... <laughs> I, I just, this song is the first time I've ever heard that epithet. So. <laughs> yeah, I would never have thought of him being called Buckwheat like that. <laughs> that was a very interesting idea. Mm. Um, and then we have, of course, Ed was called Eddie. Like that was yes. his, that was the worst name he was called was Eddie. Yes, it's it's um, an example of I believe the trope is known as murder, arson, and jaywalking, where you have the really serious things and end with the joke that's not serious. <laughs> Exactly. Although I have to say, like, my father's name was William, and everyone called him Billy. Mm. And he's like, that was the worst insult in the world was to be called Billy. Even though it's not really an insult, but to him, it was like grating fingernails on the, on the chalkboard. Also a phenomenon that today's children don't understand, but it's an annoying noise. Mm. Oh, the, the chalkboard noise. Yes, yes. We had chalk, yes. we had chalkboards just barely when I was in primary school. <laughs> you say it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. They're like, what? What does that mean? Because they don't even they don't even have whiteboards really much anymore. It's all the smart boards. Yeah, yeah. We had those by secondary. They use the term minor niner. I try my best not to look like a minor niner. That was something that. I kind of knew what they were going for, but it's, I think it's particularly a Canadian, maybe even specifically a Ontario Scarborough type thing, because um, it wasn't one that I was normally would hear. Uh, but what they were trying to do with that phrase was talk about, so you have all these grades in there together, mm. ninth grade, you're, you're the youngest. Yeah. You're the minor, you're the lowest of the totem pole, and everyone used to make fa- fun of the lowest grade but the other thing that they met someone else mentioned in there that was like oh that's where the minor niner comes in is when ontario had a grade 13 they had a lot of 18 19 year olds in there who are now formally adults Mm. and now you have them in with a bunch of people who are minors and they like to use that kind of to degrade those ninth graders like everyone else was a minor as well Mm. except for that top grade but that was their insight like you're a minor niner yeah, okay. Because over here in England, like the only the, kind of, like, the things that matter, like the age of consent, is sixteen. So everyone thinks of sixteen as adult. So even though it's you're technically <laughs> technically still a minor, everyone just thinks of sixteen as that. Because you would always go out on your sixteenth birthday and buy a scratch card because you could gamble once you're sixteen. So that that was like the phenomenon thing that we did over here. Well, I didn't, but the others did. <laughs> others did. That was their birthday birthday celebration go out and buy a scratch card yeah Uh, and then one last thing to kind of point out on this is that this song was used in a movie uh it was used in mighty ducks 3 which is is a perfect meeting since they're all in high school at that point and of course i didn't have our friend of the podcast blake riley on because he would have loved to talk about that i'm sure i have not heard of mighty ducks but perhaps that's an american thing as well Hey, this is um, Blake Riley from the D5 The Mighty Ducks podcast, and um, Tracy um, reached out to me and said, Hey, do you have anything you want to say about Grade 9? Because originally, I wanted to be on this show, but before I um, can sign up for it, it was already picked. So, hey, I got on the outside. So, thank you, Tracy, for reaching out to me. Um, ironically, I really wanted people to know, people don't know this, it, this song was a big plot point in D3, The Mighty Ducks, the show I'll be doing in our third season in 2021. And trust me, Tracy will be on the show to talk about those scenes. Um, for people don't remember, they, I actually, it's funny for I don't even have a, the movie up in front of me because Disney Plus doesn't have it on their, their service yet. But I can picture the scene in my head. It's pretty much they were at the um, Charlie and Fulton for cutting school because they were pretty much going on strike from the team because they got into a fight with the coach. And they're at a carnival and they're on all these rides, but all the rest of the ducks are in class. And in the background, you hear grade nine being played in the background. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really funny because they're having a good time while their friends are actually having a good time in class. And it's really funny to watch. And it ends with the hilariousness of Charlie realizing, I should not have had this much junk food. And he puking in a garbage can right at the end of the song. Um... So that's actually what I remember from the movie. As for me with the song, I, I love this song. It's a catchy, catchy, as I should say, a catchy little ditty. And I know Tracy's probably laughing at me for saying that word. Um, 
from Gordon. And okay, I'll tell you a little story about this song for me. I came into the Burnhead Ladies somewhere around, I want to say, a little stunt one week. Everyone kind of came in during then. But I was the person that's like, hey, I want to go back to listen to all the albums. So I went and actually, this is pre, because people listen to me, this is pre Spotify. So I had to go to the store and buy the Bare Naked Ladies albums. I had to buy them all. And so I do have every single BNL album up to, I want to say everything to everyone. No, no, I think I have up, up to um, Bare Naked Air Men. All up in my CD collection. But I had to buy Gordon. And I went through Gordon. And while Gordon is not the greatest album in the world, it does have some great songs. And when I got to grade 9, I'm like, holy crap, this is a great song. This is awesome. So I, I actually had to repeat this one over and over and over again. For then, for then, it to pop. And I realized, why do I know this song? Oh, wait, it's in a movie that I love. So, hey, that's short and sweet, how much I love this song. And I'm going to sneak a rating in here, even though it's not going to count for anything. I'm going to go with a 4.5 for this song because it's catchy. It's funny. It's very B&L, old school B&L. Very, very entertaining. Um... Hopefully, it's Tracy and Aaron doing this show. And Trace, don't worry. You don't have to include that in the rankings. Don't worry. You're good. I just really wanted to give a rating to a song that I have a show I really wanted to be on. So, um, thank you all for listening to me ramble for like three minutes about this song and about the movie. You can hear me on um, D5 The Mighty Ducks. Um, the season two starts up in April, but you can go over there right now and hear all of season one and um, a special interview I did and a special music special that all went up um, this year. So go listen to that and also hear me over on the Blake Style Show every single Friday. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me talk to you about grade nine. I'll throw it back, back to Tracy and Aaron and some weird pun knowing Tracy he set me up with. Have a good day, everybody. See you guys later. I'll see you on the show down the road. Goodbye. Oh, Mighty Ducks was an amazing, wonderful movie when I was in high school to watch. I can't enjoy it as much now. I go back and it's corny, but there are parts of it that are really absolutely hilarious still. And then it's funny because from from the Mighty Ducks, from the, this movie that Disney made, they then had to make a new hockey team out in California and they decided like Disney bought it. Disney decided they wanted to create this hockey team and they called it the Mighty Ducks. So now we have the Anaheim Ducks as new as the hockey team out in California based off from the Mighty Ducks movie. <laughs> it would be like if the Bad News Bears, if the company that made Bad News Bears decided they wanted to suddenly create a, a professional baseball team and decided to name it that it is an absurd idea <laughs> but what what amazing marketing like disney has everything when it comes to marketing like whoever thought of doing that mm. so what are your thoughts on this song let's go uh, <laughs> well i mean one of the first things that stood out to me was at the end of the chorus lines that has the word baby at the end and like that's something i always hate in songs but and it makes this chorus quite repetitive but it's very weird to have it in this song because like, it's not the sort of thing you'd sing to impress someone that you call baby. It's like, yeah, look at what a loser I was in grade nine. <laughs> this is me in grade nine, baby. That's a really good point. I never even thought of that. It's kind of this filler word that leads from one repetition to the next. Yeah, I think it's just to get the right syllables, right? Because, you know, you could have something like, this is me in grade nine. Oh, yeah, this is me in grade nine, but... It, yeah, I don't really know why it's there. I get the feeling that it might be kind of that throwback to the 60s where it was there a lot in the in the 60s and 70s music where they would use that. Mm. And as we know, Steve and them are, are big. Like, they were majorly influenced by, like, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, all these guys. Led Zeppelin didn't use it so much, but the Beatles and, and Rolling Stones would use that a lot in their music. So I wonder if it was kind of like, it just kind of flowed out and they're like, okay, yeah, we go with it. Probably, yeah. I mean, the song to me is, it bounces around from all these different references. I mean, the references are a whole different thing that I need to get into, but the way it doesn't really dwell on anything long enough to dig into it, it's it's just like a laundry list of all these random things and references as a song, which, I mean, I guess when you look back at your childhood, that's kind of what it looks like. So I wonder if that was what they were going for with this song that's just literally a pile of 
you know, tiny little nods and things going on. No, I think from any interviews I've seen where they've talked about it, that's exactly what it is. It's them trying to give snippets and snapshots of what grade nine looked like for them. And that's to them. It was all these different little references, like, cause that was what their life was about. Mm. And I think that speaks a lot about to who we are in grade nine as well to kind of take it to a deeper meaning thing in that in grade nine and 14 years old, we're trying to figure out who we are. And a lot of the times who we are is based on other people around us. It's based off what we're watching, what we're, what we're reading and what we're listening to. It's not so much based on who we are at that point. Cause we're still trying to figure that out. Yeah. And if you asked a 14 year old, like, who are you? This is kind of the snapshot you're going to get. Well, I listen to Duran Duran. I, I play football. I, you know, I listen, I, I go to the high school dances. Um, this is what I dress like. I watch these movies. They can't describe who they are as a person yet. No, I mean, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, but I mean, that's not really when I try and look back. That's not really what I think of. All I remember is the things that happened when in like year 10 for me. So I just remember what happened in each year and, you know, what what rooms we used for pl- different classes and which teachers we had and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I mean, it's a good point. It, it really is. Because as we look back, we look back with our eyes and, and our memories of what we've, accom- you know, accommodated in since then. But in seeing a lot of the high schoolers, like, yeah, that kind of describes like, who they are. Like the fact they even put their nicknames in here that becomes a part of who they are in grade nine, even if they don't like it. Like, this is how the world defines me. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I like about this song is it really kind of captures that idea of who we are at 14 and 15 and how we look at the world. Mm. I mean, I don't, I can't personally relate to it like that because it's, it's not, I mean, I guess I can't relate to the references in the sort of whole phenomenon in the song, but, you know, I can see how someone would if they had been in this grade nine situation. Well, and I think my, and, I, and I'm guessing here, but I think my score is going to be much higher than some, some people's, mm. um, including Aaron's, just because as I go through all these references, I'm like, yes, that was me. Yes, that was me. <laughs> I can identify with each one because I was only a few years behind each of these guys. And so like, that was my childhood. And there's a lot of reminiscence and mm. that, that goes with this song. Yeah, because I mean, when I was in year 10, that was 2009. It was like 10 years ago, literally. So it's very, very far from, you know, the 70s, 80s, whenever they were in (laughs) grade nine. Yeah, no, it's a distinctly different era. So like, I think if the references were different, it might might connect to you a little bit more. Oh, yeah. But then again, like you said, you didn't have a grade nine either. So that that phenomenon doesn't happen as well no it was a really really boring year for us like the year 10 just the way that our school system set up it's like the first year of your like you do like a two-year exam set in year 11, 10 and year 11 so it's just like you're just doing all the boring exam coursework in that year so it's the like the most boring year at school <laughs> Uh, it's definitely not the boring year for, for people just entering high school. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it is probably the most traumatic year. I, you know, one of the things that people kind of understand over here is, like, if you get through grade nine, you can survive the rest of high school. I don't remember ever having to think of, like, secondary school or something to survive. I'm, okay, I did nearly die a lot, but that was not the school. Well, that was mostly not the school's fault. I will get into nearly dying when I get to my memories of year 10. But, um, I, I assume you mean more like socially survive, not physically yes, yes. survive. Okay. <laughs> they don't mention it in here, but they do kind of with the uh, nicknames. There's a lot of hazing that used to go on back in ninth grade. Like, that was when people would be hazed. That's when the the seniors liked to try to pull pranks on the grade nine students. Hmm. Um, Now, I I will not share what I did to the ninth graders when I was a senior. Um, But I need an example. I need an example, Tracy. (laughs) Well, Well, for example, some people may have, when, when they were on a sports team, taken... A, another sports team's underwear and, and frozen it 
got it wet, frozen it, and put it back in their lockers. Like, they may have done things like that to them. Um, I would never have done such a thing. But... <clears throat> right. Um, I, I like to think that I was actually relatively mi- minor in comparison to what some people would do. That's mine? <laughs> because I do know that when I was on the swim team, when I was a, when I was a freshman, what they did to me was... They would, of course, swim team here is done during the winter. Makes total sense, right? Let's put them into the pool in the middle of the freezing winter. We don't even have um, a swim team here, so I have no clue. <laughs> I they you... would take us, after we had been already swimming, shove us out onto the freezing cold snow deck, make us do snow angels with the doors locked, and until we've done snow angels for two minutes, they wouldn't let us back in, and then we'd go and jump in the pool. <laughs> Most of this was done when the adults had left the room for a little bit, so they would get away with it. But yeah, there was a lot of hazing. Of course, hazing is now illegal in schools, but they don't allow it. I was going to say, I don't think it's a thing in this generation, because like, we were never, ever left alone without adults in my, my generation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, don't I think, think this we, is why. Yeah, we were never left alone with different year groups either, so it just wouldn't happen over here. Oh, I mean, I think it does at, like, the private schools and stuff, but not not at the public kind of schools I went to. Yeah, see, they probably learned from all the all the problems and mistakes that we were causing over here. They're like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're, yeah. <laughs> Why don't we get into some of the references? We, yeah. we mentioned it before that, like, the and these might be references that you don't understand, because, like, it is a different generation. I mean, we're talking a huge number of years here, mm. um, and a, a distinct difference but i think if we put different words in there that might make a little more sense too yeah i will say that the grade nine reference of half my friends are crazy and the others are depressed. Oh, i was gonna say i'm glad that's still true oh it's been going on for longer than i thought but <laughs> i was gonna say that that pretty much describes freshman year over <laughs> here perfectly um and i would i think like reading online everyone was like yep that was me yep that, like there was no one that disagreed with that line and i have to agree as well like my ninth grade year that was totally what ninth grade was i think it completely describes everyone going into freshman year in high school okay because like over here we did have a lot of people that had mental health problems but it wasn't like really obvious and it certainly wasn't that many of the year group so you just had a few kids that had like really serious mental health problems not you know, a generic sort of level of depression and craziness, whatever that is. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think this is the type of crazy that we get back to the the song crazy about, where we're all yeah. we're all a little crazy. A little bit crazy. But freshman year, it's a little bit more obvious, um, and, and mm. they're under a ton of pressure, and so it it seeps through the cracks in the veneer a little bit more at that point. <laughs> And all of our little weird eccentricities and and stressors come out at that point. Yeah, I mean, it was a weird year, but that wasn't really something you noticed very much because you've been like that for three years already at the secondary school. (laughs) Well, that's going to be a different experience. Like, grade nine for you was like the end end of the like middle school experience mm. over here for us um i went to school and and it was k through eight and then you went to high school mm. and eighth grade year was a wonderful great year you were flying high me it was stressful but it was like the end of an era and you knew mm. it because you knew the next year was going to be ninth grade you were also the high man on the totem pole so to speak like things mm. were good and then grade nine <laughs> yeah yeah and it's also the weirdest year to make people transition mm. because in terms of puberty, you've got half the class for boys are going through mm. puberty. The girls have at least started it. Like, it is an awkward phase to begin a new phase. Oh, yeah. Life. I mean, our main transition is like um, when we're 11 and like 11 is a good time because you are starting to become more like a teenager than it's like weird being with like you know four-year-old kids at school so jumping up there like that the start of middle school for you makes sense yeah no i mean the way that you guys got that set up with sixth grade being that transition yeah makes total sense like i that's where i would be like yeah why don't why don't people do that yes (laughs) because then you have sixth graders who really are 
like they're different. Their their minds are changing mm-hmm. and 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 evolving at that point. And with kindergarten, yes, so. <laughs> that is very weird. <laughs> I thought middle schools tended to be separate from your elementary schools over there. Like you know, you had three separate school buildings or whatever. It depends on how big the district okay. is. I came from a very very small town, so like K through eight was mm-hmm. the thing. Um, and they called it middle school, but they, you know, you had six, seven, and eight still in the same literal uh-huh. building as everyone else. So, uh, still in the same lunchroom, still in the same gym space. Like, it, it was an odd situation. Yeah. But the next town over, which was much bigger, had a separate middle school of six, seven, and eight. Uh-huh. So, depended on the school you went to. Right. Anyway, we were gonna get into the references at some point. I know. Let's get to get some, let's get some of these other references. So, Adidas bag. Is... Okay. We had that phenomenon. Actually, Adidas was like the thing that all the, the kind of I don't know. I can't think of a nice way to describe them, boys. Like Bart Simpson had. So... <laughs> okay, over here, Adidas is like the thing that I don't know if you know what a chav is, but chav is a very English British word for like lower class people that. You know, very poor people. It's Adidas is something that poor people have over here. Adidas was the lower edge brand. Oh, okay. Nike was the upper edge brand at that oh, okay. point. Oh, they're the same over here. <laughs> they're both really low tier over here. Well, and I think that's more of a now type thing. Too. Yes, that's a now thing. So, like back then, like there was there was that levels, but Nike was the upper of the Adidas, at least up here in Maine. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, the humongous binder. We don't even have those anymore uh, in the schools. I don't see huge binders, but that was the big thing. Like the trapper keepers. Was another, oh yeah, like, I had that. I had that at school and university. But that was just me being weird. There were already people using iPads for like all their lessons with no paper. So yeah, well, back when we were when I was in school, when these guys were in school, like that was mm. uh, that was a status thing. Like what kind of binder did you have was a status thing did you get the cheap ones at kmart or whatever school <laughs> store they had it in canada um mm. or did you have like the really like name brand trapper keeper okay, i don't think anyone paid that much attention but i mean over here we had the school gave us exercise books for most of our lessons so you would just have the school book so it's the plain notebook that would be the better way to do it so there's no status around all that. Yes, that's why we have uniforms. It's the same thing as having a uniform, really, for your books. <laughs> trying not to look like a minor niner. So, right. like, he's tr- they're trying to dress up, trying to look better so that way they don't appear to be, like, the low class in the school. Mm. Wrath of Khan. <laughs> oh, we jump forward a bit now. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people out there listening to this do know what Wrath of Khan is, but it's Major Star Trek movie, oh, okay. second in the in the movie series, um, and as anyone that loves Star Trek like I do knows, the even movies are the good ones, the odd <laughs> movies are the bad ones. Wrath of Khan was like a whole new level in movie experience, and back then it was hard to watch movies at home. Mm. If it came on TV, you had to sit down and watch it, because you didn't have... Most most homes didn't have VCRs in their home at that time and didn't have, like, they could go out and buy it and, and sit down and watch it. Like, if it came on, that was your chance to watch it after mm. it came out of theaters. So, like, yeah, if, if something came on and you're like, I should be studying or this is my one chance to watch this over the next three months and this is, like, the most phenomenal movie out. I'm going to watch the movie instead of studying. <laughs> okay, the studying is another thing that I need to get into because I never studied for tests at school. I don't know if this was me because I was a like an academically gifted school, the same that like Ed and Steve went to sort of thing. But I never studied for the test that it mentions like studying with friends and stuff. I don't remember anyone ever getting together to study for a test at school. You would just like flunk the test unless it was an exam that went on your record. You just didn't give one. So... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I remember that was a lot of my childhood was studying for these tests, like cramming it in. Yeah, I was I was pretty gifted, but at the same time, like I had to cram it in. I had to go back over all that information. Mm. And in the eighties, I know at least from my my experience, like you had a certain way you studied. There was like questions at the end of every chapter that you would go out and you'd fill those out. Like there was a whole process to studying that the teachers would teach you if you listened. And studying was pretty important because usually the stuff that was in the book was not the stuff that was 
in class. And so you had to pull all that information together for your test. <laughs> I think that's very different to now where the only thing you're taught is the test. <laughs> it's a better way. I mean, you're teaching to what you're asking them to learn. Yeah. But. We never got tested on anything we didn't learn in class because it would just have been an unfair like situation really but i mean we didn't even get homework till we were in secondary school so i guess we're very chill about these things here so that probably that reference doesn't make a lot of sense either no i see it on tv like i've seen it on buffy the vampire slayer which is like literally the only thing i've got which is i have to know what high school experience is like in america it's that one show that's the only thing i've seen so i guess i have a very oh. 90s view of it <laughs> Hopefully that's not your only reference to high school because we don't go around slaying vampires. <laughs> well, no, the, the school, the school part, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do say I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, big fan, so that makes me happy hearing that too. <laughs> like, that's carrying on. Went out for the football team to prove that I'm a man. Oh, yeah. Yep. Went out for the football team to prove that I'm a man. Guess I should have told that I like to run. Totally that w- okay, th- th- that's a very different phenomenon because you have those whole Letterman jacket thingies and stuff that I, I don't. Oh yeah. No, I've seen them, but I don't. We don't have them. Yeah. So I was a person that floated between groups, and that's the other thing that that is a distinct. It might be a distinctly American, maybe maybe more over here than over there. I don't know, but there are definitive groups of people in these high schools. They're their cliques, mm. uh, which you see on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, with the jocks, etc. Mm. And there's also cliques within the jocks. Like, if you're a swimmer or a cross-country runner, yeah, you're not on the same level as, like, the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team. There are definitive levels and types of sports that are considered to be jockish. <laughs> I mean, we didn't really... I mean, we had, I guess, what you'd call jocks, but they were, like... The, they tended just to be the Bart Simpsons of the classes, really. So they just liked sports because they were good at sports. But, like... I think in American schools, you know all the people on your sports teams in the schools. They're like celebrities in the schools. But over here, like... In a way, yeah. I couldn't have named a single person on any of our sports teams at schools. You had no idea when the school was playing a sports fixture. So it didn't, you wouldn't be proving oh, yeah. yourself to anyone if you went on the teams. Often the teams have... Yeah, they are minor celebrities. <laughs> but only if you're on the, those big name teams. Yeah, I mean... Uh, uh. I mean, our football team lost about as often as they won. <laughs> Whereas our swim team was li- literally 14 year state champions. <laughs> so, but... You didn't get your name by being on the swim team. You got your name by being on the football team or the the basketball team or the baseball team. You might hear a little bitterness in my voice there. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Over here we had so few people. Like something I've been training for. Go oh, ahead. sorry. Over here we had so few people that wanted to be on any of the sports teams. All you had to do was turn up to the club and you would get to be on the team. So Wow. Wow. That, it's not popular over here. And then over here, like, especially at my school, at least, like, if you were on the chess team, the math team, any of those competitive teams that were academically based, like, you were, like, the lowest class. You were the nerds. You were the geeks. Like, you you didn't exist. You guys have clubs for that? We didn't even have teams for that. (laughs) Oh, yeah, we had a lot of different clubs. Uh, Things to get kids interested in actually wanting to be at school. So... (laughs) How can we incentivize these kids to want to be here? We'll create these clubs and things they enjoy doing, which isn't a bad idea. But uh, but then I it mean, became this whole status thing of like, well, your club's not as good as this club. Yeah, I mean, we had clubs, but like most people didn't want to go to them because they were after school. So you couldn't just get on the bus and go home. You'd have to get your parents to pick you up, which was lame. And like, no one knew what clubs anyone else did. Yeah. So, so no, we didn't have the, the clique system <laughs> at all. So Duran Duran, of course, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Like, everyone knows Duran Duran, like, major 80s. Um, also, yeah. That's where I got... Stephen Duffy came from, so hopefully anyone listening to this podcast knows Duran Duran. Mm, i got to tell you the story of how I learned about Duran Duran, because when I was a kid, there was a, a TV show I used to watch, and on the TV show, they would they heard a competition on the radio they wanted to enter and they were, the competition question was who was the lead singer of Duran Duran so the kids ran to one of their uh, carer adult people and they were like hey you're old you like old bands right do you know a band <laughs> called Duran Duran and that's like the first exposure and the only exposure I had to them until getting into Bare Naked Ladies 
I just know them as an old person band. And the same, the funny thing is, is as soon as you said that, the name popped in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you didn't know that, if you didn't know the, the lead singer of Duran Duran, the re- lead singer of U2, there was something wrong with you back then. Like, how dare you? <laughs> really, it sounds like from the song that it's not a cool band, though. That's what it sounds like. Maybe that was different up in Canada. Like, in the United States, like, that was a band that, like, people admitted to liking. So it's kind of weird that they would say that. Um, I'm not quite sure what that reference is, but... I've read it always as, like, because it's about proving you're a man. Maybe it's a girly band to like. I don't know. I don't know. Because, I I mean, it wasn't... Of course, I also wasn't in the in crowd up when I was in high school either. So, um, and I did like Duran Duran, but maybe the cooler bands to like back then were like John Bon Jovi and stuff like that. But I don't know. <laughs> they also were a couple of years ahead of me too. So there was there might be that little bit of age difference where you're coming in ninth grade. There might have been a a status difference with liking Duran Duran. Mm, the only other reference that I had that's a bit strange to me is uh, Dad said I had to be home by eleven because we don't have co- okay. So where I went to school, like where I live is in a tiny village with less than a thousand people. And where I went to school is like a small town with like 7,000 people. So you could not stay out till 11 because there just wasn't a bus or train to get you home. (laughs) I think Americans and Canadians will live in cities so you can stay out, but no one stayed out. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll have to say like our dances never went to 11. Like our dances ended usually at 10. They started at, like, 7, they went till 10, like, 11 was pretty late. Although, high school, yeah, the lit dances got a little bit later, so maybe, but I don't remember them ever lasting till 11, so... Um, I'm presuming they're staying out and doing something after the dance that would make them stay out till 11, though. Maybe, maybe that was it. Uh, but he says, like, oh man, I'm gonna miss Stairway to Heaven. Oh, yeah. Which, so the people have to understand, Stairway to Heaven was almost always... The last song of the dance. If you were going to miss Stairway to Heaven, first of all, you were missing an amazing song, especially for these guys who were big music fans. Like, this is like the big song. Like, everyone knows how to play it if you are if you learn how to play guitar back then. Like, it was... Oh, yes. I got taught it and I hated it. I hate that song so much because it's so boring. It's so old. <laughs> Well, and even when I was in high school, like, it was over 10 years old at that point. Like, we're talking 15 years. Like, yeah, it's pretty old. But it was still the signature song for the end of the night. It was the slow dance song that everyone knew that it was the end of the dance. So that's what that reference kind of is. is Like, I'm going to miss the coolest song of the night, end of the night, slow dance song. (laughs) Wait, slow dancing is cool? I always thought slow dancing was the bit everyone hated. (laughs) My guess is that Steve and Ed there weren't so much saying like, oh, it's the slow dance song so much as like, no, yeah, this is they the, like the, song. the cool song. I can't miss this song. Mm. <laughs> so those are all the lyrical references throughout this song. But yeah, one of the things that makes this song so distinct from all the other songs and not so much on this album, but from then on is all the musical references. Oh, yeah. And this is where they're they're like, okay, each of us, to some extent, is going to show our influences in bringing music to this, to, you know, and, and who we became. So we have three major references. Interestingly enough, I don't see any Steven in any of these references. I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe he got all his references out in the lyrics, but or maybe he just kind of referen- he agreed with someone else that was in there. But I can see distinct references with the other people that are in here. Mm. So the first one we we have is Rush, Rush's Tom, Tom Sawyer. Sawyer, right. And that's distinctly Tyler. Like, he is just wailing on those drums. He is going. He is showing his, his top stuff. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, Ed loved Rush, so it's probably Ed's, too. I was going to say, so we have Ed there with Rush as well. But he, we'll come back to Ed in a minute. <clears throat> okay. Follow that up. So that was at 1 minute and 56 seconds into the song. Hmm. At 2.17, we have Andy and Jim's contribution coming in. 
And based on our discussion with Andy last week, you can totally see why this would be an Andy and Jim reference. We have the Peanuts theme by Vince Guaraldi. And it's very jazzy. And they're like, yeah, we're mm-hmm. just going to sit here and do the do everything that we would do. Like, the, we're going to do our bass. We're going to do our piano. We're just going to have fun playing this jazzy tune. <laughs> I always thought that was a Steve one because Steve always danced to the Snoopy dance on stage whenever they played it. So That was one of the great things. It's like he does the Charlie Brown dances when yeah when they're doing it and it might be that might be steve's like yep that's me (laughs) i don't know but yeah it's definitely andy and jim like it it fits their personalities and it also Mm -hmm. like it's them playing like they're they're just rocking out and then we have it followed up at the very end of the of the peanuts theme with ed playing spirit of the radio by rush at two minutes and 30 seconds and I mean, it's all Ed. Like, he is just going away on that. Mm. And that, once again, might be Steve as well. I don't know. He, he Steve fits in here somewhere. They're all referencing, so I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I remember in the private uh, stories, public stunts book, it said that the Snoopy thing was the hardest thing they ever had to clear copyright-wise. It was. Um, they almost didn't get to use it. They almost had to take it mm. out because uh, they couldn't get the... The clearance for it until the last minute. So the other thing that we should mention is that Ed had an early heavy rock band called Rage, uh, which also changed his name to Three Guys from Barry, and also changed his name to Rude Awakening um, in some sort of order. It's uncertain which order that was in. He developed a gif for pyrotechnical fretwork on the guitar, which earned him the name Eddie for Eddie Van Halen, thus his nickname in high school. Ed's first album, however, was Exit Stage Left by Rush. He was a huge Rush fan, thus Rush being in this song. So that's the main things I have that I wanted to mention Mm. on this song. Are there any other things that you wanted to make sure that you mentioned? I mean, the only thing I wanted to ask was what your great nickname was, or I was going to ask all the, you know, Aaron too, if he was here. So I don't specifically remember and it's probably because i was so traumatized that i i shut it down um i don't remember what my nickname was um i was pretty horrifically treated throughout my middle school so by the time i got to high school i had like this huge wall built up around me that i only let certain people in through and so it was probably like i at that point was ignoring everyone and anyone that was giving me any kind of nicknames. Um, I'm sure I had some, and, I, and they were probably very choice nicknames. Um, <laughs> the only one that I do remember was my senior year. Um, I was on the swim team, and I would like get myself all pumped up for my races, and I would just get this like rage going. So I, Because I, I swam the 500, so you had to have a considerable amount of uh, adrenaline running through you to go that distance. And so I'd get myself all pumped up to get ready to go. I'd be, like, fired up, ready to, like... Good thing I wasn't in a boxing ring kind of thing. And so I would get this, like, super angry face on. And people were like, you look like you were ready to destroy the person on the swim pad next to you. Like, you just look like you were ready to just destroy them. And, like, luckily you put it all into the pool. And so they called me the face. But that was more of, like, it. That was less insulting as a compliment at that point. So... At least that's how I took it. That's a, that's a nickname I've not heard. <laughs> uh, see, we had nicknames, but they were all, like, well, not affectionate, perhaps, is the word, but they were ones your friends gave you. It's never your enemies giving you nicknames. They would just ignore you. So <laughs> so did you have a nickname in high school? I had a few. But like, I mine, my main one evolved as I went through secondary school, so I think it started by year 10. I was known as E-Man, E was E with the letter E dash man. I had a different name back then that started with E. So, um, oh. but by the end of by the end of uh, secondary school, I was known as E Man Humphinator. <laughs> that was my full name name because <laughs> I used to, my surname used to be Humphreys back then. So Humphinator oh. to Humphreys. So I would also get called E Slice, which sometimes got turned into E Slizzle. So um, we had a lot of white boy gangsters over here. 
that was the thing that all the kind of jock type boys they all wanted to be gangsters so they were like hey e-man hey j-dog so like my best one of my friends was called j-dog so my my posse was like me e-man j-dog uh hobo jesus and titch <laughs> i love those names that's great yeah i, I don't know i just remember being in like my at the, t- at the end of uh, secondary when I was in sixth form my main friendship group known as the library losers or the library loners because we just hung out in the library was like they literally looked like the members of BNL because we had a big loud bald guy called Disco Stu we had a, a really plain looking guy who looked good in a suit called Barbara Streis Dan we had a random ginger kid called Jacob and we had a girl called Barry who looked like Steve so <laughs> <laughs> the any kid ladies looks like my high school friendship group at the end of secondary oh that's amazing oh that's amazing I have to ask you a question, and I can cut this out later on. Yeah, sure. Of course, I was a huge um, fan of, and now, of course, the name of the show is Escape. Oh, whose line is it? Not whose line is it. Was, um, uh, oh, of course, it's Escape Me. It's the British show. I used to love watching British shows growing when I was in high school. We had a British who's line. Um, what was, no, what was, it, was it about? Um, it was about a, a store, uh, like like a... Oh man, why are my words escaping me? Like a dress store or, or a uh, lawn, like there was a lingerie department, and it was oh, like, are you being served? Are you being served? Thank you. Yes, that's, that's it. Yes, you think you, Mr. Humphreys, Mr. Humphreys? So I have to ask you: Did you get a lot of references to Mr. Humphreys? No one knew that show. Like I did not know that show until I was like twenty years old. So it's too old a show. <laughs> that's so. great because that, I'm sure you would have been like horrendously treated if that had been the case. I know he was very camp and gay and stuff, but like I was very obviously queer in high school, so oh. I did get a lot of I got a lot of teasing about that. But it was kind of cool because I was trans but not out, so it was kind of cool to be people to be joking about the gender that I actually kind of was. So <laughs> it didn't bother me. You're like, that's cool. That's what I want. They were doing me a favor. <laughs> Do you want me to cut that out, or you want me to keep that in? No, so- I'm fine. That's, you can keep that in. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Unless you have other things that you would like to throw in. I mean, I wanted to ask what yours was like. I guess maybe yours was a lot like this song. I was going to ask what sort of, you know, like references or something you would have put in for your. But I mean, if you're their age, then I think the references almost perfectly fit who I am. I think it's one of the reasons I identify so much with this song. Mm. So, yeah, like every single one of those pretty much matches up except for the Duran Duran line where it's like, yeah, I loved it. what's wrong with it? Um, but again, that might have been me in grade nine being like, I don't give a care what you think I like and what I don't like. So just yeah. back off. Like that was me and my friend group. <laughs> we just built up like just- this. We were we weren't the outsiders, but we were the others that weren't the outsiders. We we're like, mm. I don't care what you think about us. We're not going to do anything outlandish or like goth didn't exist back then, but out, outsiders were kind of the thing. And like we weren't like mm. that. We weren't like we're going to push society, but we're just like we are who we are. Except us, who cares? Yeah, I think that was my kind of group too. I think we were the kind of kids that were like late bloomers, so we were a bit behind everyone you know and it didn't matter and they just left us alone because we were like you just leave younger kids alone because you're like i don't want to deal with them they're gross sort of thing (laughs) (laughs) that's great i don't know what your grading system is over there or was obviously like you're not in school anymore but so over here we had the a b c d f grading system when i was going through school it's not there anymore but that's what we used so Mm -hmm. A's were like the top of the class. Like that was what you were aiming for was an A. So my mm. my question is zero to five. How many A's do you give this song? Uh huh. Okay, I would give grade nine three point seven five A's because it it would definitely be higher if I could relate to the references. I think. So that's probably where I knock it down. But I love the energy and the humor of this song. It feels. Like, it's got the energy of something being played on the back of a speeding pickup truck. <laughs> it's the only way I can describe it. It feels like one of those things that's just rattling down the road and not stopping for anything. That's true. We didn't really talk about the music of the song itself. Mm. Like, this song really is, it's driving through the whole thing. It's very upbeat, very catchy, very, I don't know, it, there's a happiness to it, which 
it's funny because you're talking about this bittersweet type of experience that they keep talking about backed up with this really happy music. Mm. Um, and it makes it sound a lot happier than I think it is from what you said. That's one of the reasons I was interested to talk about this song because it sounds such a nostalgically happy thing, this song. And I think for the most part, like that is that what grade nine is, or at least it was for me. And I think a lot of people, um, unless you were part of the popular clique, like <clears throat> it is this really odd amalgam of like, I'm on to this next experience in life. It's happy. It's upbeat. It's stressful. It's kind of bittersweet in a lot of ways. And I think they mix that between the lyrics and this and the music, like this, they kind of capture what that experience is kind of like. And I remember grade nine feeling like it went really fast because it was just like, boom, 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 one thing after another constantly throughout the year. Um, so yeah, I think I think the music actually captures that pretty well. It's strange because my experience, I would say year 10 was one of the slowest years for me. <laughs> it was very boring year and we didn't do much. And I don't remember like all the kind of media things that were happening were really boring. I don't really remember much of any of it. So because of that, because of all the references, major nostalgia for this song. Um, I I love everything about the song. It it definitely makes me feel good listening to it. I would never turn it off. And this to me is what BNL quintessentially sounds like. You know, in talking with Andy last week, several weeks ago for people listening to this, but for me last week. This song, like, brings out so much of what the band in the early years was, which is each of them was bringing something to every song and making mm. it distinctly bare naked ladies. You can hear Andy on that piano just like making it sound. If if you take Andy out of that, if you take the piano out of that, it becomes a lesser song. It becomes different. If you take any member of them, including Tyler, out of the song, it's different he brings that that driving rock to this song versus if it wasn't in there you wouldn't have the same song anymore um and mm. that, that's what makes this bnl is that each of them is bringing something so quintessential to who they are um and so for that yeah. reason like this is a five for me wow wow <laughs> and speaking of that like so the reference this week this the other thing that makes this song special is this was the song that they played when they were on TV for the first time ever. Um, they were on a TV show called Friday Night with Ralph Bermugi. I'm going to mispronounce that. I know I am. Yep. Um, <laughs> ben Murgy. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, and they played, this was the song they played on that. And of course, the wonderful thing is you got Steven doing the Charlie Brown dance during the, during the Vince Guaraldi breakdown. The other really cool thing about that is... And I don't know if this was played in the first season of the show or the second season. But the reason that's important is the second season of this TV show, the house band was the Look People, which people might remember. Oh, yeah. Kevin's band. <laughs> was Kevin's band. <laughs> so if that was true, if they were there during the second season, then you have literally the whole BNL cast on the stage at the same time without realizing it. Mm. So I'm going to post that for people to kind of go back and, and listen to. Plugs, Mill, where can people find more of your stuff? I don't want people to find my stuff, actually. No, just go read the newsletter on Get Bare Naked if you want. I love reading the newsletter. Every month when it comes out, it's like, as soon as it pops up, I go in there and I start reading through and trying to find as much information as I can about the band. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. And, and the cool thing is, is like, I keep up on as much BNL stuff as possible. And I don't know how it's possible, but you guys always somehow pick up on something I didn't yet find. <laughs> I mean, I could tell you, but then that would kind of make me redundant. So, <laughs> so that's amazing. That's great. And, uh, you know, I, I think about when I read Get Bare Naked. I think that you guys give me what I'm going for every month. I, I get all kinds of great information. I, I would say that you're a great provider. <laughs> oh, God, it's time for Tracy's terrible seg. <laughs> it's like the evil twin of Aaron's hot take, Tracy's terrible seg. <laughs> oh, I wasn't expecting that one either. <laughs> 
I didn't even have anything written for that one. That one I just totally ad libbed. I had to find a way in last minute. So <laughs> okay, that was actually good for that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us this week, Mel. Yeah. Hope to have you back soon. It was it was really great talking with you, and hopefully next time we'll actually have Aaron with us to join us for the discussion. Yes, yes, uh, I haven't met him yet. I'm starting to think he dislikes me. <laughs> That's what everyone keeps <laughs> saying. Like, yeah, yes, he's, he's treating me like a children's song by BNL. <laughs> Did you hear that, Aaron? You need to come on and talk to Mel and prove to Mel that they are not wrong. And well, thank you so much for joining us, Mill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. And yeah, I hope to be on more songs. <laughs> <laughs> and for all of our listeners, thanks. That was fun. Thanks. That was fun. Don't forget. No regrets. Except maybe. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wild, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.